Alec, is it okay? Is it okay if I pick the piece of wood that you work with today? One thousand percent, sure. Yeah. All right, because I'm gonna. I I kind of want it to speak to me. Yeah. So I'm I'm gonna look around just for a second here. I want to find I want to find the right piece of uh, what what is the wood that you have here, like all up in the rafters? Uh, there's white cedar, red cedar, cottonwood, poplar, uh, basswood, butternut. Um, but most of what you're seeing in the upper uh, rafters there is cottonwood bark. Cotton? Oh, it's bark. Yeah. It's not even wood. Right. Okay, it's outside of the wood. All right, I want to go find. I want to go find the right one. Just hang on one second. Sure. This is the one that I picked, Alec. Beautiful. Would Would you have ever thought that this is the one that I would that I would have grabbed from the shelf? Um, it's not super surprising because uh, one of the things you want to look for is a natural uncut edge, and this has that, so you can see it. Right. How did I do? Good. You did well. You did. This is a cool piece. It's a triangle, which is a very strong shape. Yeah, and you, I mean, you're an award-winning uh, wood carver, wood artist. So just go, just go ahead and clean it off a little bit, you know. What, what are you looking at right now? Like, what's, what's going through your head? Um, right now I'm thinking, uh, gosh, this thing is so dusty. Uh, <laughs> that's right. It's so hard to carve dusty pieces of wood. <laughs> In my experience, you know. Yeah. yeah. You know, when you just grab a piece of wood and it's just so dusty. Mm, very distracting. I agree. I agree. Yeah. <laughs> so really what I'm thinking about uh, with the dust is like their deposit of sediment, dirt, and stuff that collects over the years from uh, just being out uh, the outer part of a tree that can damage the, the edge of a tool. So mm. I'm trying to keep it as clean as possible uh, so that it doesn't dull my tools quite as much. Yeah. When... Uh... When you, this is cottonwood? This is. Cotton yeah. bark? Cottonwood bark. Yeah, this comes from, uh, this probably came from Wyoming or Montana from a tr hiking trip out there, a camping trip. So you, you went and got this, this piece of wood yourself? Right. What, yeah. What does that look like? Do you just, you just drive to Wyoming and you look for a cottonwood tree? Yeah. I mean, that's To a, find some cotton bark, which. Yeah. I'm surprised because that's, that's really thick for bark. It is. Yeah. So it all started um, uh, with a camping trip. I went on with my buddies, with uh, yeah. three other guys, and uh, we were out there and uh, happened to see some giant cottonwood trees. We stayed in an old cabin mm -hmm. with no electricity, candlelight, and uh, and gave ourselves stick and poke tattoos. Actually, <laughs> nineteen-year-old doofus kids giving each other stick and pokes, and uh, I found these cottonwood trees near our campsite, mm -hmm. and I had been carving, a career carving at that point, 19 yeah. years old, touring the art show circuit, um, selling carvings. And I knew this was a great wood to carve. And when I saw these trees, I was uh, really excited. And so I collected a bunch of it, probably, you know, private property, whatever, probably not illegal. <laughs> but uh, I just... And you brought it back. Just put it in boxes and shipped it back home. So we're going to, you're going to carve here. Is... You can get started if you want, but sure. it, is it a, is it cool for me to talk to you while you're while you're carving? Yeah, totally, absolutely. I don't know, like when you're, oh man, it's getting messy. Right, I love that though. Okay, this is a. You know, I know that there's going to be people who are going to watch this and listen to this, and they're wondering. And I'm going to feel so stupid asking the question. I'm going to feel so dumb asking this, but I'm going to ask it because people are wondering and I'm wondering. Are you ready? I'm ready. I think I'm ready. Is, do you feel like the wood is speaking to you? Mm. 
Like, like when you're, you're hold, you're holding the wood. I know you got the dust off and stuff, but like when you, when I handed it to you, did you, like, did you already know what it could be? Mm -hmm. You know, as you're kind of like getting the outside, right off. Like, do you, do you already know what, what wants to come out of this piece of wood? Interesting. Um, or do you not even think about that? It's okay if you don't even think about it either. I just want to know, like, because when I hold a piece of wood, I'm like, it's like a piece of wood, but, that's, <laughs> but this is how you make your living, you know? Right. Um, so with that thing of, uh, you saying, you know, it's, uh, does it speak to you? Yeah. It doesn't really like, uh, you know, most of the time, thankfully it doesn't audibly speak to me. Um, <laughs> otherwise I might be, uh. Right. This would be a different type of podcast. Yeah. I'd probably be talking to a counselor or a psych, but, um. Uh, somebody did once ask me what uh, my carvings tell me and what what maybe they if they speak to me and I yeah. said that uh, if they did speak to me they'd be saying ah stop because <laughs> <laughs> most of them are human figures yeah and so they'd be very unhappy if I was carving on them uh, probably right so no but uh, all kidding aside the there is an element of um, the wood telling you what it wants and what I mean by that is this yeah. When you're carving in a piece of wood, sometimes something will break off, right? That you didn't intend to mm. break off, especially mm. when you're carving a piece of found wood. So this is a material that has its own kind of weathered character. It has its own natural shape. Right. It has limitations, right? I can't go beyond the boundaries of this piece of wood. Right. And so what's beautiful about that is um, it's defined by those limitations. Mm-hmm. So because I have uh, only the ability to work within the parameters of the piece of wood, um, I am then limited to stay within those boundaries, right? So then there's the, the shape of the wood, there's the character of the wood, the flakiness, the weathering of the wood causes it to be um, less um, homogenous or even all the way through. So these things dictate the shape and the outcome of the carving. So in that sense, the wood speaks because it has a shape. It speaks because it yeah. is worn out and old and might flake off. And then you have to then adapt to whatever it does on its own. Mm -hmm. And so there is this sort of like collaboration that happens with, uh, with a found piece of wood that you don't get with like a milled block of wood. Yeah. Right. Uh, and then with regard to your other question, like, how do I decide what to do? Yeah. Um, for me, um, my main interest is people. Right. So I'm always thinking about uh, people and looking at people. <laughs> right. <laughs> I'm at the grocery store and I see an interesting face and I'm trying to take a mental note. You know, like, what a great nose that guy has or that lady has. And so you're trying to be discreet, you know, and creep that one out. But, uh, yeah, but so, they could become a wood carving. You never know. You, you never, never know. know if you see Alec at the store yeah. just checking out your nose. That's true. It's happened, <laughs> it's happened before. Yeah. So you know. when when you when you're holding this piece of wood though, do you you feel like you feel like something wants to come out of it and you're just kind of delivering it or what? Mm. Um that kind of spiritual thing, you know, of course, Michelangelo or Michelangelo would talk about that, you know, how uh, he sees it within the wood and, it's, and maybe it's already there and he wants it to come out. Right. That's, that's, that's kind of what I'm getting at. Like, yeah. is that a thing for you or are you just kind of like, you know what, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna take my knife here and, and see what happens. Yeah. Um, you know, I think there must be some elements of that because there are times where you make something yeah. that you're not capable of making, right? And so I almost, I often feel like, you know, I should say I'm not happy with every carving, you know, maybe like one out of every 10 carvings, actually really cool, you know, but on those days when I make something that I really love, you know, I don't want to sell, I want to keep, mm -hmm. uh, it doesn't feel like I actually have the skills to make when it's done. I feel as disattached from it as other people. Yeah. And that's a blessing because it means that I get to appreciate it. 
right? Because I don't feel like, oh yeah, I remember those cuts and those steps that I, yeah. it's not like a math equation where I could show you the pattern, right? It's making, that's why it makes teaching so difficult and why teaching is so interesting to me is that I'm still deconstructing this for myself. Maybe that makes me a bad teacher, but <laughs> I'm, I'm trying to figure it out in real time, so. Yeah, when you're carving, uh, is it kind of like a flow state for you? Like, what do you think about? Do you think about life? Do you think about relationships? Do you just think about the, the piece that you're making? Um, yeah, don't really think about a lot. I think that's what's nice, is I have a very, uh, I think I have a busy mind. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's and it seems like maybe it's so busy and a lot of people can probably relate to this that I don't always know what I am feeling or thinking at any given moment. And so what's nice about carving is it slows me down and uh, I don't have to worry about that stuff. I'm not thinking about any of it really. You know. So it does keep, keep things simple for me. When you carve by yourself, do you listen to music? Or do you just, I'm trying to imagine what life is like for you here in the studio. Yeah. Do you listen to music? Does, does Alec just sit here quietly? Hmm. Yeah, I used to listen to, uh, I used to listen to music a lot more while I was carving. Mm -hmm. Whereas uh, now, you know, I really want to be able to, because, you know, there's like the left and right brain that you're using, you know, all the time, right? <laughs> you're using like your rational brain, you're using your creative brain. And, uh, you know, when you've got an idea down pat, uh, you don't really have to use your rational brain. So, for instance, I can just carve something that I've, I've done something very similar to and talk to you, right? I'm not going to make any huge revolutionary uh, mm -hmm. things while we're talking because I'm using my left brain talking to you right now. Yeah. What's nice about turning the music off is it allows me to uh, toggle back and forth a little bit better between like the left brain that says, does this, does this, does this suck? Does okay. This, is this good? Or do I really like this? And so when I'm listening to music, it's all the vibes are good. I'm just, I'm moving, you know, I'm grooving, I'm carving. I'm just, yeah. the chips are flying. I'm making something a lot like maybe something I've made before. Mm-hmm. Because my brain is in the music. I love music. So, right. like, too much. Like, I'm just, I love music. So, I actually kind of have to, uh, lately, I kind of limit the music a little bit. Like, when I'm doing something that requires, like, planning or design, the initial phases, I can't really listen to music while it's happening. Yeah. But I can afterwards, you know, while I'm roughing in shapes and things like that, so. How many years have you been carving um i've been carving for 16 years now mm. and what was what was the first thing that you what was the first piece of wood that you sank your knife into and you carved something and you're like that this looks really good i like this um, i'm proud of this i was pretty proud what is, what is that by the way this is a gouge so you were just using a knife, a knife, and now you're using a gouge. Yeah. So gouge is a curved chisel. So it's got like a rounded, mm -hmm. curved end yeah. to it. Is that my nose? Um, <laughs> it might be. It's okay. I honestly thought about it. It's okay. I'm not posing for you. I'm just here to ask questions while you're. Carving. I'm gonna grab a quick little. This one. Yeah, what, what was the first thing that you you carved? I get maybe like 16 years ago, mm -hmm. and you realize I think I have a knack for this. Right. I like this. Hmm. I mean, I think I knew pretty much from the first carving I made that I was uh, I was into it, you know, because I really hadn't experienced. I mean, I, everyone's kind of sat there and whittled on a stick as a kid, you know. Mm -hmm. with the, the pocket knife like most boys at least have done that but I hadn't really experienced this sort of like all-encompassing um, absorption in anything yeah um, before uh, carving and so the first time I tried carving I think my busy uh, monkey brain 
uh, as everyone seems to call it nowadays, was uh, quieted for the first time. So, yeah, I just felt like something something special was happening for sure. I just didn't I just didn't feel like uh, I'd ever experienced that where three hours just just completely gone. You know, mm -hmm. as, a, as a twelve year old boy, you know, not a lot of things did that for me. So, so what did you? What was one of the first things that you carved? Like, what type of object was it? Uh, it was a whittled uh, boot. It was like a leather, Ooh. like a cowboy boot. Do you still keep it? Um, I'm pretty sure my mom has Your it. Your mom has it somewhere? Yeah. She would From have her, proud, she's her proud, proud son. She's probably proud of it, yeah, I'm sure. Yeah. <laughs> so so you, you're able to, you're able to make your living being an artist. Yeah. Carving, carving wood. But did you ever have time where you wondered if, if this would be possible at all? Like, did you ever think you're going to have to get like a, I don't know, like a big kid job right. or a degree? Yeah. Or did you always know like, you know what, I could, this is how I could make my way through the world. Yeah. Yeah, I did. Uh, there was a period of time, actually multiple periods of time as a kid where I had to uh, kind of think about things, you know. Because there were people that I looked up to and respected a lot who mm -hmm. said, you know, don't you want to, like, have nice stuff? You can't, you can't make wood carvings for a living and have nice stuff. You know, like, you can't be an art, you, you know, you can't make carvings. And uh, so I remember somebody, I won't say who it was, but somebody said to me who I really looked up to, and I, I still think she's a great person, but said, uh, you like really expensive food. Like avocados and all this stuff. Like, how are you planning? How are you planning on doing carving and buying all these expensive avocados? Like avocados. And so, man, I just I really. When you said expensive food, avocados wasn't. <laughs> that's not the first thing that I thought you were gonna say. <laughs> that was her first thing, so it stuck with me. Man. But no, I really. I mean, I took some. That's the lighthearted one, but I took the more serious ones to heart, you know, because these people I looked up to and. Mm -hmm. I didn't know. I hadn't lived life yet. I thought maybe I, maybe I am crazy. I don't know. Maybe this is not. Maybe I, my ignorance is is showing. My homeschooled, uh, I don't know. It, you know, just lack of life was uh, showing. So I figured out that uh, if I went to college, it was pretty cheap, and uh, it would be kind of a backup plan. So I started going to school, and then uh, I went for a while, and then I met a geology professor who uh, at the beginning of class said that uh, you know basically every one of you here is hugely benefited from from having a, a degree and so your odds of having a, a high paying job without a degree are very low in fact here are the stats and then I remember emailing him afterwards some pictures of my art and telling him what I was considering do you know what I did kind of then because I was already starting to teach and do a little bit of uh, you know one-on-one -on -one stuff and group classes and I'm just starting to sell my art and uh, he said, you know, I really think you should consider doing this. I think you have something special. Oh man, so this is the person who said the odds of people being able to be successful right. in art are low. Right. But you sent him your stuff and he was like, go for it. Yeah, he kind of gave me the green light. And uh, actually one of the most meaningful uh, interactions I had was with my dentist. I was sitting in his chair and he said, you know, Alec, I hear you're in school. If my kids had your abilities, you know, at your age, I don't know that I'd send them to school. Really? I would encourage them to do what they love because you know what? Not a lot of people have a skill that they've fostered. Mm -hmm. And you know, not everyone needs to have a degree. And I listened to him. This is your dentist? This is my dentist. This was, he work, was he working on your teeth at the time where you were just kind of like, uh-huh, uh-huh? <laughs> this was a really cool dude. Uh, he, um, he had been given, you know, like, he upgraded lawnmowers, gave our parents a brand new riding lawnmower. He was just a, like a super nice, he had equity with our family, you know, like relational <laughs> equity, like a nice, he was a nice dude. So uh, when he said that, it kind of weighed a little heavier than just a random guy, you know, so... Of course, every every young man wants to hear he doesn't have to go to college, right? So, mm -hmm. so yeah, I, I dropped out and then I went for a couple of years just pursuing carving, and then I got the same avocado lecture, and then went back to college, 
And uh, I finally decided, you know what? I don't need, I don't need to go. <laughs> I don't need this to do what I already am going to end up doing when I leave here, right? Right. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I'm glad that I went for sure. It's not, it's, there's no regrets there. It was an awesome experience. I learned how to write and that stuff is helping me out now uh, as I've got a, you know, writing a book with a publisher and that those skills are, you know, they don't, they're not uh, lost on me now. So that's good. But yeah, I didn't, uh, ultimately didn't need it. I feel like, uh, I kind of have a, I kind of have a tendency to, uh, Jeremiah can attest to this. He's behind me. He's helping to produce our podcast today, but I kind of have a tendency to I fill every silence with uh, something to say, right? Yes. <laughs> I always have something to say, or a question, or a thought, or something insightful. But uh, I feel like while I'm watching you, I just want to... I just kind of feel... I feel like I'm in that flow state, too. Like, there's a face... There's a face that's showing up from that piece of wood. And I am completely mesmerized by it. That is crazy, man. You're killing it. Thanks, bro. It's not every day that people show up with, uh, you know, seven or eight cameras to film, <laughs> film you doing this. So it's kind of, it's a little bit, it's fun for me too. So. I have a list, I have a list of people that I've wanted to sit down and, and uh, have conversations with passionate people. And you're one of the people at the top of my list. I appreciate it. For that. sure, man. I, I was <laughs> like, I was like, I gotta somehow get a microphone and a camera over to Alec nah. because people have to see what this, what this person is capable of. <laughs> I appreciate that. Yeah. I was honored, man. I'm really honored that you had me on. Honestly, I was, uh, first of all, I was really stoked to hear that you're doing this because, uh, it's such a, it's such a great, it's such a great thing for you if it fits you well. I appreciate it. it you know, like having a podcast or telling stories, definitely, uh, it's such a saturated market. You know what I mean? Yeah. I don't, I don't want to just be out here. I don't want to just be out here, uh, telling stupid stories or reflecting on dumb things like I, I really want to talk to passionate people and mm. and catch them in their element <laughs> so do you have a favorite spot that you like to carve like do you is it here in your studio is that your favorite spot do you like to do you like do you ever just like go outside by yourself or hmm. right hmm not really. Um, yeah, I really like to, uh, I, I mean, natural light is important for me. Like that's why I built the shop with the skylight in the top and this, you know, could, you know, shout out to my dad for, uh, sticking with me, hanging out with me up there, helping me figure out how to do everything. He was instrumental in most of this, but, uh, my buddy John Bertolini helped me build it as well. He did, uh, kind of showed me the ropes, how to do stuff. And then, then he would come over for a, for an hour or two or three and then show me what to do and leave and then uh, come back the next day and repeat and so that was a cool uh such a cool skill to have like to learn from uh from old you know, from older people like, with, with the knowledge in the trades but uh, anyway so yeah i mean i was able to build this studio to be kind of my ideal spot because mm -hmm. i spent uh you know like nine or ten years carving in a very dark mm. uh, barn uh, do you do you regularly make trips out to Wyoming, Montana to go and and find the wood that you're gonna turn into art pieces? Yeah. Is it just you? Um, just you in a truck, or do you turn it into a big experience? I turn it into a trip with friends because uh, I personally I wouldn't really probably I don't know how much fun I'd have doing that uh, on my own. 
Mm -hmm. um, who knows? But yeah, I always bring my friends with me, and uh, it's been a couple of years since we've been out there. But uh, how much wood or cotton bark do you get? And where do you go? Yeah. Do you just like stop on the side of the highway and you're like, hey, look, there's some wood. <laughs> like, how do you how do yeah. you find how do you find the wood that you're gonna turn into something? I do. Um, I I end up. Um, first of all, we rent a U-Haul. <laughs> when we first went out there, we just brought my van. I had this like uh, kind of like a Sprinter van. Ford makes a Sprinter van called a Transit. Yeah. And uh, I had a Transit van and. Uh, we would wake up and be covered in ticks and uh, with the wood, you know, we sleeping with the wood was not the best. We figured out that that wasn't the best you option. You slept in the U-Haul? Well, we slept in my, tra I owned a Transit, this is before. Oh, right, so this okay. Is this is preceding oh, our man. brilliant idea to just get like a separate trailer. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So you would go out, find the wood that you're going to carve, yeah. put it in the van, and then you'd go to sleep. Right. And the wood is in the van with you. Right, and then we just wake up and strip naked and pick all the ticks off of each other. You know, it was awful. It was one of the worst experiences. Um, juxtapose that to like beautiful snow-capped mountains, just butt naked, looking at each other's buttholes, trying to find ticks. <laughs> Wait for real? Oh yeah. What the we, heck? Yeah, we googled it, man. Because that's what you, I mean. Basically, what you have to do is if you find ticks, you have to like make sure that they're not staying on you. I guess. I don't know. Either that or someone duped me good. <laughs> Man, right. That's, uh, that's I didn't think possible. you were going to go there. Yeah, I'm sorry. It's all good. Yeah. It's part of the story. But anyway, we, we, we wised up. We rented a U-Haul uh, this last time and had a lot of fun down there. Probably collected, uh, I don't know, 1,000 pounds or so. Of, what? Man, and you less. bring it all back here. Yeah, so there are fishing access sites out there. That oh. Public property. And uh, the trees are they're dead and fallen, and so you can actually you can actually take wood from these dead fallen trees. You know, you're not chopping anything. You're not bringing any saws with you. You're not bringing you know, axes or stuff like that. You're just uh, collecting fallen dead pieces of wood. Yeah. So yeah, that's it's a beautiful experience, man, being out there amongst the the trees and seeing the mountains out in Montana and Wyoming, and just the, it's a beautiful beautiful experience feel like you'd ever want to live out there? Yeah, every time I go out there, I have to convince myself not to move out there. But I feel like a lot of people, I mean, I know there's some parts of Montana that are remote and also near civilization, but a lot of those places, you just feel like you can see why the crazy people ended up moving out there. You know, just <laughs> so isolated and uh, so separate from, the, from civilizations. The appeal of it, but it's also the thing that probably would scare me about doing that. Do you have a do you have a favorite type of wood to work with? Um in terms of how it feels in your hand and Oh yeah. 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 For me that's uh Because I've I've seen you mm -hmm. make some things out of different types of wood and then also like clay and stone. But do you have do you have a favorite yeah. a favorite type of wood that you like to work with? For sure, yeah. The um Basswood is something, it's funny that everyone, when they start carving, they get handed a piece of basswood. That's like, like the a, starter. It's like grandpa's going to get you into carving, he's going to get you a piece of basswood. Mm. And that piece of basswood is going to be soft, even, white, kind of boring looking, right? Nothing, mm -hmm. there's not a lot of character. You don't see this grain that you'd see, these striations, the color. That's what I love about cottonwood. Yeah. But as far as tactically pushing a sharp edge through the fibers of a piece of wood, there's nothing really better for me than basswood. Mm -hmm. And it took years of pushing against the, uh, the Enneagram 4 in me that would need to be original. <laughs> Pushed against <laughs> that because it's like, oh, it's basic wood. Everyone uses basswood. But uh, yeah, it's a, it's a really fantastic wood card. It's tactically very beautiful. Pause. You pausing? Yep. Just, uh, okay, just pause real quick. Yeah. How many how many more minutes would you need to get it into something closer to a final form? Mm. Ish, I think ten. Ten. You'd probably get this to something. Can you hit that? Then. We're good. We're good. Good. All right. Are we? Re All right. Cool. Keep going.
Has there been anything that you've carved where you were uh, you were nervous to do it because it was your first time, or someone commissioned you to do it and you hadn't done it before? Yeah, um, it's funny. That's a it's a good question because uh, I you know I've been doing this for so long that um, when I started out, I wanted to all I wanted to do was faces, and so mm. I uh, I, got, I ended up just getting good at them, and so people would. These art shows, I'd stand out there and sell my faces, and people would ask if I could carve their tree branches or their stumps and, you know, all manner of things. A lot of times people would want me to carve their dogs, and I had never done that stuff before. So I would always say, no, that's not really what I do. And, uh, and you know, I just would say, yeah, I, folk, I, kind of, I would say almost with pride, like, no, what I focus on is faces. That's what I like to do, and I'm going to keep getting better at that. And, I get uh, that. And I, in a way, I'm glad that I did that. But I think a big part of that was just me being afraid of trying something new. And uh, it worked for me. I got, I got better at faces because I stuck to it. So it was good on one hand. But on the other hand, I think I missed out on some opportunities to carve things that are really hard. And so I found personally that like everything that I'm most afraid to carve, which is uh, pretty regular, it's a regular experience to feel like, I don't know what the heck I'm doing, but I'm going for it. Um, that, those, those experiences are usually the most rewarding ones. Um, right. It's like you actually challenged yourself. You actually felt like you overcame, uh, the resistance that you feel when you start a project that you're not sure how to tackle. So that was, uh, that was super huge. Okay. I have, I've got another question that, man, I don't know why I feel stupid asking it, but I just, <laughs> I just know that, I just know that other people are probably wondering this sure. as well no dumb questions okay do you when you finish a project yeah. and like you see you see this this piece of cotton bark mm -hmm. and you have brought a beautiful face from it yeah i mean this is this is a piece of wood that definitely could have just been a piece of firewood right and now there's this face kind of like coming coming from the wood yeah do you ever feel do you ever feel like the the piece of wood is like thank you <laughs> you know because i'm just i'm it's just an thinking, interesting question i'm just thinking no that, one's ever asked that i know i'm just thinking that you know a, a piece of wood like you're holding very easily could be just a piece of firewood or not mm. even used for that just like just kind of disintegrate and rot in, into the ground All right and but it's turned into this beautiful piece of art where there's like man there's there's a face there's like a personality there's yeah there's something that would not have existed if it wasn't from your hands do you do you ever feel or consider that the wood is like thanks for honoring Th thanks for hmm. honoring me yeah i don't know i don't know why i'm stuck on like the wood personality thing yeah do you know what i'm saying yeah yeah, no, I, I guess um, it's cool that you're thinking that way. Yeah. I think people, um, maybe there's something I need to learn there, but uh, personally, I don't really think about the wood as being um, animate or like having its own kind of thoughts or other than, again, the, the dealing with the sort of character of the wood. Um, I often feel like I'm the one that's more blessed by the wood, though, in the process. Like, I feel like, I almost feel like, thank you, at the end of it. Like, mm. um, because it just let me be, you know, I feel like it, you know, if you want to use, put it in your terms, it's like it let me be, do what, what I did to it, you know? Yeah. So that's cool. I think I'm, I think I'm just really sensitive to, uh, all right, this will give you a little insight into like mm. how my brain works. Yeah. Ever since I've been a kid, Alec, um, like Christmas Eve, yeah. I might be like in a car, like looking out the window. I remember this as a kid, yeah. and we drive by one of the like the Christmas tree lots. Yeah. And I, f since I was a kid, I've been sad. <laughs> I've been sad for the trees mm -hmm. that don't get purchased. <laughs> Because they, because they've been because they've been cut down, you know, right. like they're there, 
and they're not going to get to be what they were intended to be there for. Hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah. I think that's I think that's where I'm coming from while I'm watching you carve yeah. and I'm looking at this this piece of wood. And I'm like this this piece of wood is getting to be something amazing, you know? Hmm. Like maybe what is always meant for, but I I just remember driving and looking out the window, I'd see these trees and be like, man, they're cut down. Like, they're they're not going to be anything more than what they are right now, oh, right? Yeah. And and they're not even they're not even going to get, get to be a Christmas tree in someone's house. Hmm. I think that's where I'm coming from right. with, with the, like, the piece of wood. Because I'm like, it, it could just be sitting there right. in the forest. Right. So, that's I think that's where, that's where that's coming from for me. Yeah, I can see what you mean. Um... I feel like you can, even if it's a piece of wood, you can still find a way to, to honor it. Yeah. No, I mean, that's a, that's a fun way. I feel like there's a children's book in there somewhere that you might need to write. Definitely. Maybe we collaborate, you know? Right. I have thought about that as a kid's book before. Really? Yeah. It's a cool idea. About like a kid who looks out the window and like, Asks his mom what will happen to those trees. Hmm. Yeah. Oh wow. It is interesting, isn't it? Like to think that we're sitting in a structure, we're standing, covered by, surrounded by mm -hmm. a structure that was that's like made by trees, and you guys are filming a dude carving a tree. It's like trees are so present in our everyday life. Mm -hmm. like, all of our homes, most of our homes, you know, are built with trees. It's like kind of wild. Mm-hmm. So yeah, maybe it's worth giving a second thought. That could go all day, honestly. I could carve this until kingdom come, so. You tell me when to stop, I'll... We'll aim for, like, five minutes. Sure. Um... Is this, uh, you mentioned that some, some things you, like you would listen to, you'd listen to, to music mm -hmm. and you're able to do something you're familiar with. Do yeah. you feel a familiarity with what you're carving right now? Oh, familiarity. Like I've done it before. Yeah. Um, no, this one's kind of turning out like there's, it, it kind of reminds me of like a tribal mask or something like the sharpness of the nostrils and like the big, mm -hmm. The bigger, like, stronger mouth mound and all that. Um, so I guess, yeah, it's actually kind of different. I kind of meet my words. <laughs> <laughs> well, this this is interesting. How do you how do you decide since you do so many faces? Yeah. When do you make the decision that this is going to be like a like a sleeping resting face, or or this is going to be like an alive like eyes open type thing? Um, I kinda, when, do you, when do you have to make that call when you're carving? Oh, I see. When do I make the call? Like, have you already passed that threshold as to whether or not this would be a like a resting face with the eyes closed or yeah. if their eyes would be open? Right. That's a good question. I, I think, uh, you know, really, you can start with closed eyes because there's material covering the eyeball. And then if you don't like that for some reason. Uh, in fact, the process of creating carved eyes uh, leaves you with something at a certain stage that looks very much like closed eyes. So you can kind of at that juncture decide if you're gonna finish the eyes, open them, you know, where they're looking, all that sort of stuff. So these are all kind of just natural things that you come into when you uh, start developing a carving. So I mean, at this point, I really could open his eyes if I wanted to. Um, what do you feel like the wood wants? Yeah, <laughs> that's that's like that's like where I'm where I'm coming from. Yeah. What do you want? What do you, do you want to be awake? Do you want to do you want to talk to Joe? Man. Do you want to talk to, Joe? <laughs> do you want to, talk to Joe? It's okay. <laughs> He's shy. He's oh, see, that's what I'm talking about. See, now we're on the, we're on the same level. <laughs> we have got some personality here. Yeah, I've I've definitely uh, gosh. Yeah, things get kind of weird in here sometimes. I'm not gonna lie. Can I tell you another thing about myself? Yeah, please. I mentioned like the Christmas tree story. Mm. Um, do you know what else I like? I feel. I feel bad about. <laughs> What's that? Um, I feel bad. 
I feel bad about flowers. Mm. I love to get like my my kids and my wife flowers, wow. but I'm also sad. But I'm also sad at the same time that that they're uh, that they're dying as well. Yeah, you know what I, you know what I mean. I yeah. If only there was a way for me to honor the flowers like you're honoring this uh, piece of cotton cottonwood bark. Yeah, maybe um, you can always dry the flowers. That's the way I always justified it. Man. Is drying them. Mm -hmm. You know, like I have the flowers from our wedding bouquet. Yeah, uh, my wife's wedding bouquet and. Uh, yeah, my grandma's, uh, the flower from her funeral, from her, uh, casket still in my truck, you're sleeping on the dashboard, so, you can kind of keep the memory alive, right? Right. Um, yeah, the, this was not what I was expecting to carve, that's really, that's for sure. I'm not even sure what's happening. Alec, I don't know. I don't know anybody else that can do what you're doing right now. <laughs> I do. <laughs> I <thought> I <laughs> right. <laughs> and who are better than me, that's for sure. But, uh, there's a lot of really amazing carvers that I've had the opportunity to meet and be amazed by. Mm -hmm. Even just students coming in with just amazing abilities, like b b ability to just see um, shapes and design in a beautiful way and just execute it that's the craziest thing is when people can just see something and make it you know so I'm I'm, I'm literally constantly amazed by uh, what people can do with this within this kind of craft or whatever art form whatever you want to call it I appreciate you letting me just sit here and watch yeah of course I'm glad you listened to your uh, professor and your dentist, man. <laughs> it sounds. I'm, I'm happy to see so people. Dumb. I'm happy to see people living in their passion. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Me too. I'm glad I listened to them too. Yeah. Just to kind of close things out, in terms of the work that we get to do in schools with young people. Mm. I, I just love to see, I love to see people alive, man. Hmm. I love to see people in the fullest expression of, of who they are. Yeah. I think that's why I'm so enthralled with what you're able to do with just a stupid piece of wood. Yeah. You Thanks. know, like you're able to Keep somehow, <laughs> sorry, not a stupid piece of wood. <laughs> uh, I think that that's why I've just been so enthralled with your work, man, because I love to see people alive. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah, that and that's what that's what we do in schools. Like we yeah. we help kids feel more alive, <laughs> and uh, and so seeing you take seeing you take a, a piece of wood and bring it into a really beautiful expression just kind of it just kind of speaks to me as a person, you know. <laughs> You know what I'm saying? Yeah, that's cool. I mean, yeah, I mean, there's not a lot of uh, opportunities that people get to do stuff like that. They yeah. To make something that they're proud of. And, mm hmm Yeah. And so that's, uh, that is important. Like, teaching for me is, uh, it is really, there's nothing, there's like no better feeling than seeing someone else's success in mm -hmm. that area, you know? Yeah. You get to see that as a teacher. Um, I'm sure, you know, with like a student who doesn't believe in themselves. And sometimes... You know, I talked to a guy and I was actually having a frustrating year of teaching last year. I wasn't feeling well, I was uh, having some health problems. And so I was telling this guy, uh, interviewed him on my podcast, his name is Rick Harney, um, just complaining to him on the podcast. And it's like, yeah, do you ever find that, you know, you just can't get the people to do, you know, to trust themselves? And he's like, people don't trust themselves. That's the problem. You have to try, you have to be their, you know, their rally for them. You know, I don't remember the exact words, but just basically saying that, like, I'm like, man, this is a great teacher. Like believing in your students more than they believe in themselves is, uh, that's something that I think we, we can all improve on in our relationships, but that's a beautiful, I feel like, yeah, thing to be able to do for someone. That's what all my best teachers, I mean, they, they literally directed my life, you know, through doing that, through believing in me. Yeah. And you're good at that, Joe. You're, you're great at that. No, Appreciate that, doing man. Doing that for, for those kids and even for me through the years. You know, I remember 
we would uh, play music together. Mm -hmm. And then uh, years ago, church, right? Right. And you would say things like, man, can't you guys just picture Alec on stage one day? <laughs> right, man. <laughs> you're just encouraging me, dude. Well, that's why, see, I can't do, I can't do what you're doing, but I, I feel the mm. skill that you have with your hands. I feel that with my words. Mm. I feel like I'm able to bring, yeah, dude, it's huge. Bring out a great expression in people with mm. the way that I communicate in the way that I interact with them. So yeah. that's why I do feel like I am an artist yep. with you here. Yeah. <laughs> but still just enthralled by what you're able to do. That's awesome. Thanks for letting me have a conversation with you here in your studio, man. That was so fun.